Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 11th annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machik with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service, and I'm moderating the marketing track today. And assisting me is Jean Anderson, and she is with the South Central Library System. Thank you, Jean. So our final presenter in the marketing track today is Cordelia Anderson, and she's going to be talking about the marketing funnel. And some of you may have heard of this approach and concept if you have heard Cordelia speak before, or it might be new for some of you, but either way, we know it's going to be a great presentation. So Cordelia, please begin. Great. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be joining you all in Wisconsin. As I told Jamie, when we met a couple weeks ago, I spent some time in Wisconsin um, several years ago in the southwestern Wisconsin area, and it was so beautiful. And I hadn't been to Wisconsin before, and I got to drive through the Dells and see all the pretty, and I know you guys have a lot of biking there too, which I really enjoy. So I'm wearing my scarf in solidarity, even though it's uh, a balmy 50 degrees here in North Carolina. I'm sure it's a little chillier up there in Wisconsin, but i um, super happy to be here with you all today and talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is the library marketing funnel. So um, let's just dive right in, shall we? Oh, and I should mention, uh, I will take questions. I'm going to leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A or the chat, um, and we can look at those at the end and, and answer as many as we have time for. And I also have a short little video that I created on the marketing funnel. And if we have a little time at the end, I can show that to you all and share you with you the link so that if you have to go back and explain this concept to your library, rather than you trying to replicate everything I've said, it's just a short little five minute video that you could show to other stakeholders inside of your library to kind of help them understand the concept a little bit better. So. All right, so my background, many of you may already know, or if you don't, I worked in 20 plus years in libraries now. So libraries are my lifeblood. Um, I spent 15 years at Charlotte Mecklenburg Library in North Carolina, um, and eventually spending the last 10 years there as their director of marketing and communications. And, you know, we went through so many changes and evolutions and how we approached marketing over the years that when I left and started the consultancy, my goal was really to take what I had learned over 15 years and try to share it with folks at other libraries to shorten their learning curve so that they could implement some of the changes that maybe took me five years and they could implement them in six months or a year. Um, and so the marketing funnel is one of these concepts and, you know, general marketing and communications planning and all those kinds of things. You know, it takes a long time to sort of figure out how these things work within a library setting. And so my goal is to really help kind of take those big picture marketing and communications principles, apply them to a library setting in a way that is practical and implementable for people who are actually working in a library setting. Because as we all know, libraries are unique and different from any other industry um, in the world. So um, I also wrote a book on this topic. And if you're interested, you can always get it from ALA Editions. And I also do some on-demand training where I can go more in depth on individual topics that might be of interest to you. So for today, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the marketing funnel concept. As uh, Jamie said, some of you may be familiar, some of you won't, but hopefully it's a good refresher either way. And then we're going to talk about how libraries can really move people through the marketing funnel to take them from potential customers all the way down to existing customers, repeat, loyal customers, and hopefully advocates. Then we're going to talk about some of the challenges that exist in libraries marketing funnels. Um, and how we can address those challenges by removing barriers for our customers. And that will hopefully strengthen your relationship with customers and increase all those things that we want to increase, like usage, circulation, program attendance, and so on. Um, so where did this idea come from? One thing that I used to do when I worked at my library, even though I was the marketing director so I could like sit in an office, is some of our uh, administrators who were over the branches said, you know what, we should we should uh, take administration on the road and we should go out and work in the branches so we get a better feel of what it's like for, for the folks in the branches. And this is something that I really strongly recommend. And I had wanted to do it anyway, but I was always, you know, too busy. So getting that suggestion really hit home with me that, yes, I definitely want to go out and work in some of our branches, the little ones, the big ones, 
you know, the service desk, the children's desk, just so I could have a better understanding of how the library operated kind of from top to bottom. Um, and so when I would go out and work at the service desk and I would be kind of a lowly peon, you know, helping, helping the experienced circulation staff, because of course I was not as knowledgeable um, of their day-to-day -day duties, um, but I would observe things that were really interesting to me. So it's one thing to sort of sit in an office and describe to your customers what they can expect when they come to the library. But it's another thing to actually observe those customers coming into the library and interacting with staff. And I started to notice some really interesting things like, gee, when a lot of customers come in, they're happy, they're excited, they think, oh, I'm at the library, I'm going to get something for free. And most of them, when they would come up to the desk, it would turn out they had some sort of fines or blocks on their account. So they'd walk up smiling and then look sad because they weren't getting something for free. They were going to have to deal with this fine or this block or this other issue. So that was one thing I started to notice. The other thing I started to notice was that our staff in their desire to help our customers had created all these lovely workarounds to help customers still access services, even if they had these blocks. But these workarounds in and of themselves were, were really com complicated and labor intensive for the staff. And since I was working in, in administration, I was thinking, gosh, you know, we're always looking at all these statistics going, huh, why isn't circulation going up or why is computer usage flat? And here I am at a desk seeing the answer in front of me, which is that all these customers have all these different challenges with using their library card the way that they want to. So that kind of got the juices flowing. So then I, when I would go back to my office, I would look at the data and I started to notice other things too, like uh, how many of our customers' accounts were expired or were over the fine limit or you know, for one reason or another couldn't access services. And it really got me thinking, um, which is what eventually brought me to the idea of the marketing funnel, which I'm going to explain to you now. So the marketing funnel is sort of because what part of what I was doing in thinking about all this data and what I'd observed in the branches was how can I go to our leadership and explain to them why I think some of these practices are actually hurting our ability to grow? Um, how can I convey this to them in a simple way? And suddenly a light bulb went off, you know, over my head because I'd had a staff member who had talked about the marketing funnel. And I was like, I wonder if the marketing funnel is a good way to use this to explain to them, because it's really a way, <laughs> excuse me, it's really a way of visualizing the process of turning potential customers into actual customers. And it's used across all industries, right? So the idea is you cast this really broad net to all of your potential customers, you grab hold of them and bring them toward your organization, and then you get them into the top of the funnel. And we know that some some potential customers are always going to drop off because that's nat natural selection, right? Um, for, for a variety of different reasons, some of which we can talk about. Um, so that's why it's a funnel, you know, because it narrows as people drop off. But ideally, you want as many of those people from the very tippy top to move down and become customers. And so that really is your goal as a marketer, but it's also your goal as a service provider, as a library staff member, is to keep as many of those folks who show that initial interest in your library or who could potentially be interested in your library, to keep as many of them engaged as possible and help them all to become library card um, holders and library account holders and library customers. Um, because the more people who you can bring to your library, the greater the positive impact that you can have in your community. And that's really why libraries exist, right? It's to help people and to help communities be stronger. Um, so it is our job in libraries, all of us, not just the marketing department, to ensure that our funnel is as wide as possible, bringing in as many as possible, and that we're not seeing too many people drop off. Um, and one of the things that I really learned in my experience of talking this throughout my library was that we were actually the cause of a lot of people dropping off. So we were literally um, cutting off our nose to spite our face because we were saying out of one side of our mouths, we want more customers to use more services. And the other side of our mouth, we were pushing customers away through some of our own practices and policies. Um, so here is the marketing funnel. And again, this can apply to any industry. So as I talked about, you start with the widest possible opening with awareness, then people become interested. They consider using your 
your service, your library, if you're a for-profit or retail organization, you know, they think about making a purchase per perhaps, um, then they evaluate, hey, does this library have what I need? You know, can it meet my needs? They make a decision and then they take an action or a transaction. Oops, I jumped ahead here. Um, and that could be they sign up for a library card. They decide to they register for a program. They decide to check out a book or they decide to just physically visit a branch and see what the library has to offer. If you're lucky, that action or transaction turns them into a customer and then a repeat customer. So they have a good experience, they decide to come back, they borrow more books, they go to more programs, they access databases and resources, and they start to think, wow, this is a pretty awesome library. Um, I'm, I'm now a loyal library customer and I'm gonna tell my friends and family how great the library is. And I'm even going to tell, you know, my local uh, elected officials that they should increase funding to the library. So they either become loyal customers or even advocates. And advocates can take any form from, like I said, just spreading the word about the library, spreading the love for the library, or even, you know, advocating for more funding for the library. Um, and so the way it works for your libraries, of course, everybody in your community, if you're a public library, um, is a potential customer, right? And so all of those people you pour into the top of the funnel, they move down again, they do one of these actions or transactions, and then hopefully you get them down to the bottom of the funnel. Now, we have some holes in library funnels, and we can talk, we're going to talk through each of these individually, but these are just the ones that I identified working with my library and also just doing, you know, some research into library policies and practices among public libraries within our industry. So I and then I went through and actually plotted these barriers as to what stage they occur in the funnel. So we'll start here on the right. The number one issue a lot of libraries face is lack of awareness. And again, we're going to talk through each of these one on one. But I think we can all agree that we don't we aren't able to get the word out as much as we would like to our members of our community. So lack of awareness is the first thing. Then as they're moving into consideration, they may have relevancy questions. They may think, well, the library I remember when I was a child was, you know, dusty and quiet and didn't have very many books. And that's not the kind of, I don't need that anymore. You know, I've got my own books or whatever, um, or I don't need, you know, I don't need to go there. I can access everything I need on my own. And they don't, maybe don't even know all the wonderful things that your library offers that they could use because they simply aren't aware so relevancy questions is a big thing, and we'll talk about that more. Then they might hit barriers to getting a card because not every, unfortunately, not every circumstance is the easiest circumstance for people who want to get a library card. It may not be as seamless as an Amazon, for example, where you can literally put in an email, make up a password, and boom, you have an account. Of course, you have to put in your credit card, right? Um, but there can be some barriers to getting a card. Again, we'll talk about that. We may have arcane policies. Uh, all of us probably can point to something in our policy manual that's a little out of date, um, perhaps, or procedures too. We may have really complicated or cumbersome procedures like those workarounds that I mentioned earlier. Then we get to things like expired cards and fines and fees. These are things that libraries deliberately do in order to block customer access to the library to serve two different functions. Expiration, of course, is to have people come in and prove that they still live in the community and update their contact information. And of course, fines and fees is a way to ensure people return materials, but can also lead to blockage of accounts. Then on the left, we have at the interest level, inconvenient hours or locations. So you may have a customer who wants to use the library, who's motivated, but maybe they work during the day. And the one thing they want to do is bring their child to story time. And there's no story times on the weekends, for example. Um, then you have under evaluation, and I've run across this before with people, for example, who want to check out eBooks from the library. We may have multiple web-based services and logins that they have to remember. And again, for people who are so used to that seamless Amazon-like experience, to have to remember multiple different passwords and click through different links to get to things may seem too cumbersome for, for them and they may just give up, frankly. Then we have the negative experience, um, which hopefully is not happening in your libraries, but you know, sometimes we have customer service issues that pop up in any type of organization. And finally, when we get to the repeat level here, we could have missing or incorrect contact information. So let's say somebody comes to the library, uses your library, and all they need is a little nudge to come back, but you can't nudge them because you have no way to contact them. 
So again, let's go through these in more detail one by one, starting with lack of awareness. This cartoon, I think, perfectly depicts the challenges that we have in libraries with raising awareness. Um, you know, people are standing outside of the library with their perception of what's going on in the library, thinking that maybe libraries aren't even needed anymore. And meanwhile, the people who are inside the library are doing all these wonderful things. They're saving money. They're getting help with research. They're getting a job. You know, they're doing better in school as a result of the library. But all of that's happening inside and people outside don't necessarily know that. Um, so you could have a few different issues. You could have people who are non-customers, like the little cartoon man here, who have an outdated perception of the library or don't know what the library does. Then you could have existing customers who perhaps use you for one service, but they don't know all the other services. Like you may have people who loyally come in every week and borrow books, but it would never occur to them to research their family tree with you. Um, and then you could also have a situation where you're just not able to reach everyone in your market because you don't have a marketing budget. And that is a big challenge. And what I found over the years, too, is that even when libraries do have a marketing budget, a lot of times it's called a printing budget. And it's more about printing brochures and flyers and things. And it doesn't have that flexibility built in that that money could be used for other things like digital marketing or paid advertising or things like that. So that's our lack of awareness issue. Then we get to the inconvenient hours or locations that I mentioned. Um, again, limited weekend hours can be a real challenge for people who work during the week. Even if you have evening hours, for some people that may be really convenient to go after work, but for people with kids, that's not gonna be convenient for them necessarily because they gotta pick them up from after school activities, have dinner, and then they're all exhausted. Um, or you may have a branch that's too far away, and there's not a whole lot you can do about that unless you can build a new branch. Um, but finding ways to reach those communities through things like bookmobiles, outreach, et cetera, is, you know, can be a way to overcome that. Um, I've also seen where a library branch has to be closed for renovations or expansions or even repairs, and that really can disrupt people's usage of the library. And sometimes they don't come back. You know, I was a real statistics wonk at my library. So I was always looking at the stats. And so if we had to close a branch for renovation, I was always looking at the numbers after we reopened to see, have we gotten back to pre-closure levels? And when are we going to get back? Because when people, people's brains are, you know, um, wired a certain way. And so if they get used to having to find an alternative for the library because it was closed. They may continue using that alternative even after the library opens. And I've seen some of that with COVID as well. Um, you know, most libraries are still struggling to kind of get back to pre-COVID levels because people's behavior patterns change. Um, and then finally, when we talk about inconvenient hours or locations, your website is also a location in a way, as is social media. Um, and so making sure your website is mobile friendly um, is also important because, again, it's all about that convenience and making it easy for someone who might be, say, wanting to visit the library, but they're in their car and they're just looking on their phone, making sure they can still access what they need to, to get. Um, then, of course, we've got the multiple web-based services and logins. And as I mentioned, a lot of this can come up with the uh, different digital platforms. And I will say, um, when my own child, who's now 17... <laughs> Um, was in middle school, you know, we were trying to do middle school math and there's something about middle school math that really challenges me as a parent. And I wanted to use one of the online tutoring services through my library, but I had so much difficulty logging in that by the time I um, had finally gotten my correct login credentials, my kid had already given up and moved on to something else. And I ended up having to just like Google it. You know, I wanted to use the library because that was going to be the more reputable source of tutoring help for my child. But in reality, when you're a harried parent and you're trying to help your kid and you're in a rush, having to keep track of that additional login information can be sort of the make or break situation that may cause you to move on to something else. So um, another challenge too, with the out with the third party web-based services, again, which I love, I'm a huge user of all the services that are listed here on the, on the screen, just as examples. Um, but they can also mess up your web analytics because you're constantly passing your customers to these third party websites. Um, and so you get at something called your bounce rate can actually be very high because a bounce is when somebody leaves your website for another website. Well, in your case, that bounce is actually a good thing because they're using a library service. 
but um, for your website analytics, it doesn't look that way. And that, that can be another challenge is to really understand how people are using your website and your services when you don't have a full picture of that data or an accurate picture of that data. Then we have the negative experience. And as I said, you know, we'd all like to hope that people don't have that negative experience in their libraries, but they do. And so, you know, I was looking online and I found this was a real example of a Google review that someone left about a library near me. Um, and they felt, you know, that they had been treated very rudely and they felt that they were being chastised by the library staff member. And that's really unfortunate. And I've certainly heard from my library colleagues how challenging it can be sometimes to deal with customers who maybe can be a little rude themselves. Um, but we have to also accept the fact that somebody's lived experience that they bring when they come into the library is different than ours. And so they may actually have a, a bad experience and we need to acknowledge that and recognize that and do our best to try to address that and not just let it go, you know, and we actually did some initiatives at my library to uh, intentionally collect reviews and then share them with the branches so that the branch managers could follow up. And it was a really good process. And I will say even some of my good friends and colleagues who were branch managers got a little defensive sometimes. And we had to kind of have a conversation to say, this is not about making you or your staff feel bad. It is simply about you know, being proactive in ensuring that this relationship that you're building with your customers is a positive one. Because not only does this person have a bad experience, but if they share it on, excuse me, if they share it on Google, everybody who sees your Google business profile is going to now also see that negative experience. And so that could negatively impact other customers as well. Um, then, of course, as I mentioned, we have the missing or incorrect customer contact information. So for, for us marketers, you know, email marketing is a great, low cost, highly effective way to reach customers. Um, and customers actually really like receiving emails from the library. I've even had people who find out I work in libraries who've complained to me <laughs> that their library doesn't send them email marketing. Um, and as someone who ran a large email marketing platform that emailed literally hundreds of thousands of people at my library, we never received complaints. And I always like to say that because I know there can be a little hesitancy with email marketing sometimes, so we don't want to be a nuisance to our customers. Um, but certainly if we're emailing our customers and we're not hearing complaints, then that means we're giving them good information that's relevant to them. So it's really important not only for email marketing, but for things like account notices, hold notices, uh, overdue notices for people to be able to access their accounts and know the status of their holds or, you know, their when their items are due for them to have given you correct contact information and for you to have a reliable way to reach them. And the, and the best, most efficient way to do that is with email. So I encourage you to ask yourselves, do you have access to accurate contact information for your customers, including email? And are you able to contact them and tell them about other programs and services? And what about account notices, you know, and helping them avoid fines and fees? Then we get to the relevancy question. So I'm sure all of us who work in libraries have had this experience at least once, if not dozens of times, where you're at a social event and somebody walks up to you and says, oh, you work for a library? Do we still really need libraries now that we have Google and everyone can get books on Kindle? And it makes you just feel angry inside, doesn't it? Because we know that there's so much more that libraries offer that have that go way beyond just access to books, right? Or, or Googling something. Libraries have evolved and added so many services and we create, you know, spaces for people to come together. And there's so many wonderful things that we do, but people just simply aren't aware. And because we don't have those big marketing budgets, it's hard for us to change those perceptions. So we really have to be intentional and thoughtful and proactive about getting the word out about everything that libraries do so that, you know, people can understand that we are so much more than that simple idea they have in their mind of, you know, doing a simple Google search or getting a book on Kindle. And I will say it's not just people who don't use the library who have these perceptions, even library customers who may be like, well, I still like a print book, so I go to the library, but, you know, that's all I do. I just check out print books. And they even they may not know that you're there helping people get jobs or you're helping, 
you know, parents fill out the FAFSA form so they can get student aid for their college age kids or whatever wonderful, you know, unknown and underutilized service that you offer. So it's important to address and be aware that these relevancy questions are out there and we we really can't stick our heads in the sand about this because it's a real challenge. In fact, I view it as an existential challenge for libraries um, to communicate, you know, proactively about what they do and their relevance. You know, I think sometimes it can get when you're dealing with people who don't understand the value of libraries. We can feel a little bit frustrated and we can kind of want to go into our bunker and say, well, I know the work I'm doing is good and important and that's all that matters. I don't have to deal with these people who don't know, you know, but in reality, we do have to deal with those people who don't know because they are part of our community and we need to help educate them so they can benefit from the library as well. Um, then we've got, of course, the barriers to getting a library account and in my um, book, I use this example. So while I was working on this concept, I was reading the book American Gods by Neil Gaiman, if anybody's read that. And there's a main character whose name is Shadow. And at some point in the book, Shadow goes to a library and he's like wanting to get a library card. And the librarian says, well, you can sign up and we'll mail it to you and you'll get it in two weeks. And I have to laugh because I know Neil Gaiman is a huge um, library advocate, library lover. He came to my library. I got to meet him. He kind of um, I was very starstruck at the time. Um, and so I know he loves libraries, but he also knows libraries. And so the fact that he put that detail in there was very telling because a lot of people will go to a library and be kind of shocked when they find out they have to wait to get a card. Now, a lot of libraries have moved to fix this, uh, especially during COVID, which I think is great. Let's keep that up. Um, but a lot of places uh, in libraries, people still need to wait um, because they've got to apply online, but they're still, or even if they apply online, there's still several steps that have to be taken in the background. The person either has to come in person to show ID if they're trying to apply online, or even if they apply in person, they have to wait for that card to be processed and mailed to them. Um, and so again, going back to the chat before this session started and people talking about the Amazons and those other seamless experiences that they've had, most for-profit or you know retail organizations would never make a customer wait. Um, they want to give them instant access because they want to get that customer in the door. They want to get them into their funnel and keep them in their funnel, right? But only in libraries, well, I shouldn't say only in libraries, but specifically in libraries, we often are comfortable making people wait. But in our society and the way people are now, they don't want to have to wait. They're not used to that anymore. And their expectation is that they're going to get instant access. So how can we give that to them? So again, we can bring them into the fold and get them using and loving their library. And I just love this little cat. Um, that's why I include this in my presentations. Um, but also that cat is endorsing getting a library card. I just want to point that out as well. Um, then we have our arcane policies and procedures, which I also mentioned before. Um, and again, I've lived and worked at libraries, so I know all about the policies and procedures. They can be a behemoth to crack open those, you know, manuals and read through them. Um, but libraries still use a lot of paper-based processes and forms. Uh, one of my uh, things that drove me crazy was the... Um, meeting room booking, you know, our library had moved to pretty much online reservations for everything except meeting rooms. And we were still using uh, notebooks at every branch, you know, and I, as the marketer wanted to market our meeting rooms as a service that people could use. But then once you got people interested in meeting rooms, you still would have to tell them to call a branch, which just felt like a very antiquated um, way to make people book meeting rooms. And oftentimes they would have to physically drive into the library and hand over a check to pay our nominal meeting room fee to reserve that meeting room. So they would have to make two trips, once to the library to pay for the meeting room, and then a second trip for their actual meeting. Again, people are used to seamless online reservations now. You book a hotel, it's not like you have to drive to the hotel and drop off a check two weeks before your vacation. You do that online. And so that's people's expectation. So that's just one example is our paper-based processes and forms. We've got to try to work through a way to do more of these things in a more efficient way, at least to the customer. We want the customer experience to be very seamless. The new buzzword is frictionless, which is both annoying and accurate, you know, everybody's looking for that frictionless experience. 
Um, the other thing is, you know, the appearing in person, it's not just the meeting room rentals, there's other services as well that people would like to access online, but they have to come in person. Again, renewing library cards and things like that, placing blocks on accounts due to fines and fees. Um, you know, one thing I was really proud of at my library toward the end of my time there, in part due to these conversations we were having about customer barriers, was we actually changed our policy from blocking people from all library services if they were over the fine limit. So they they couldn't borrow print books, digital books, use online databases, or use our library computers. And that's where a lot of those workarounds had come into play because our staff wanted to help people get online on the computers. We decided, and it suddenly hit us that, hey, you know, if the whole point of fines is to get people to return their items on time, if we're going to penalize people, sure, let's maybe stop them from borrowing any more print books until they pay their fine or their overdue book fee. But let's not restrict them from using computers or ebooks because they have no choice to, but to return the ebooks. Ebooks automatically return themselves. And it's not like they're going to pick up a desktop computer and walk out the door. And if they do do that, we have bigger problems than, than our policies. So we changed that policy and we made it so that all of those customers could still access every single service except print books if they were over the fine limit. And so that restored access to tens of thousands of people um, who were over that fine limit amount to now be able to use computers. And as a bonus, it improved our computer statistics gathering because instead of that workaround where a customer didn't get counted um, properly when, you know, cause we, we report out our statistics as libraries, right? We report them to the state. We report them to grant funders and things. And don't we want our statistics to show the accurate portrayal of all the people that we're reaching and all the people that are getting on the computers? Well, you know, we found that our statistics were not accurate because of this policy. And because we were pushing people out the door saying, no, you can't use computers. You can't use eBooks. So lifting that barrier helped the customers, but it also helped the library. So it was a win-win. Um, the auto expiring accounts is another real challenging one. And what I've seen, which I really like to see in the library industry is this move toward proactively contacting customers when they reach the end of that time period where you normally would expire their account. Um, and reaching out to them and asking them to go ahead and update their contact information um, so that their library access isn't cut off. Because that cutting off of access abruptly with the expiration um, is a real disruptor to that relationship. And again, if you're picturing the marketing funnel, that's potentially a loyal customer who's using you on the regular, getting booted out the door and not being able to use their account. And in my book, I told the story of my, my partner who was a library board trustee at a library system, his account got expired. He never received any correspondence from his library. He thought it was because he was over the fine limit. He paid his fines. His library card still didn't work. And it wasn't until I suggested that we meet up at a library that he thought to go in and talk to the librarian and find out that his card had expired and showed his ID and all that. But if a library trustee doesn't know that that's what's happening, how do we expect a normal uh, customer, normal person on the street to know why their library card suddenly isn't working. Um, so I really think we need to be think differently about why we're expiring accounts. If the purpose is to ensure that people still live in our community, are there other ways that we can do that that doesn't disrupt that um, relationship? There are also some tools that you can use to va uh, verify people's mailing address without even making them do anything. Um, and there are some library vendors that offer that service. So I think it's a great a great solution that doesn't disrupt our customers. All right. Now, unable or unwilling to email customers, as you may have guessed, I'm a big advocate of email marketing. I've talked about this a little bit already, but one of those barriers, and we don't necessarily think of it as a barrier, but we do have a barrier when we require our customers to have to take that extra step to opt into our email marketing. Um, so I have seen a lot of libraries go from that to opting all of their customers in. And I did it at my own library. And again, I can I can only speak for my own library and clients I've observed. But at my library, we had a unsubscribe rate of less than 1%, so virtually zero, and no complaints. In fact, the only emails we ever did get were people complaining about their accounts expiring, not about the email marketing. They were like, why are you sending me this marketing email? And then I try to do this and my and my cards expired, you know? Um, 
So email marketing is a great thing, but again, we want to make it effortless for our customers. I sort of like the term effortless more than frictionless. I'm, I'm workshopping this here, um, but how can we make it effortless? How can we opt all of our customers into email notices? Again, most of them want this information. They see it as a value added. They like knowing all the great things they can do for free at the library. So why wouldn't we give that to them? Um, and as I mentioned, I've had clients who went to this model as well. I had one client who did it during the pandemic. Um, they went from only reaching about, I think they were reaching about 8,000 out of 80,000 customers prior to the pandemic. They opted all their customers. in, so now they were reaching not 80,000 because they didn't have emails for everyone, but a, a much higher percentage, like probably 60 plus percent. And again, their unsubscribe rate remains under 1% and they receive no complaints. So it's not just my experience. Many, many libraries have moved to this and it's a great way to communicate with customers. They enjoy getting the emails. And as long as you are really thoughtful and you plan it out really well, um, you can really strengthen your relationship with your customers and you can drive increases of all kinds of library usage from circulation to computer use. And in addition to just giving people the good feelings about the library. So, um, and here's just a little more information of just making that case for email marketing. You know, people are used to giving emails out now. Libraries are incredibly ethical, moral organizations. So if you think about all the entities that you've given your email address to, how many of them would you say are highly ethical organizations, right? Not probably not all of them, but you still gave them your email address. So don't you feel like if there's anyone you can trust with your email address, it would be your library because libraries, we have a code that we follow, you know? So again, I think making, getting email addresses and sending email messages that are well thought out, value added, relevant to our customers is actually an additional service that we provide. It's not spam. It's not annoying. It's actually really value added. So just wanted to make, get that get that point home. Um, we already talked about the expired card or account. Um, again, just think about it, weigh the fact in your mind, how many loyal, good customers am I hurting to catch a few customers who maybe shouldn't be using the library? If you do the math, you're probably hurting a lot more customers than the than any good you may be doing with expiring accounts. Now, I've, you know, I read a recent article, well, I actually listened to it on NPR about ebooks and they really made a strong point there about having to make sure that only people in your geographical area are using those ebooks and stuff. So I get that there are reasons to want to limit access and make sure people from outside your community aren't gaming the system, but I think there are better ways to do that. Ooh, I see a lot of uh, notifications in the chat. So I hope we have some good questions. Fines and fees. You know, a lot of libraries are going fine free. So I don't feel like I have to lecture about this as much. Um, but I think it is important to still remember that fines and fees are punitive um, and people see them as such. You know, I'll meet people out socially. I remember I was part of a storyteller group once and this guy came up and he was like, oh, the library, I love the library. And then his face fell and he said, but I don't go anymore because I had fines. You know, it's like he felt ashamed. It was his own shame that was keeping him away. And I find there's a lot of that that people carry about library fines, probably from experiences they had as children. So again, the more that we can change it so that fines and fees are not punitive, the better. Um, and if we can eliminate them altogether, that is just fabulous. But I know not, again, not every library can do that. But there may be other ways to, you know, if libraries are relying on that fine and fee revenue, there may be ways to replace that revenue in other ways. And it's really important to remember that fines disproportionately impact the lower income people who need you the most. And we did a deep dive into our fine and fee data of my library and looked at the zip codes where people were living. And we found it was in an inverse um, proposition, pretty much the higher the percentage of people in a particular zip code that were over the fine limit, the lower the median household income in that zip code was. So in other words, the poorer communities had the highest percentage of people who are over the fine limit. And those are the people who need us the most. So it's really worth thinking about. All right. So, and then uh, just other challenges I'd like to talk about is this overall mindset of self-imposed limitations. I think we've all sat in a meeting at some point in our lives where we made a suggestion and someone's like, let me tell you all the reasons that's not going to work, <laughs> you know? And so 
instead of starting with all the reasons something won't work, it's, I think it's better to start with the assertion that here's what we want to achieve. You know, we want to engage more customers and we want to eliminate this barrier and then work back from that. So start by asserting that you are going to fix this problem and then go back. And as you hit roadblocks, you know, work with your colleagues to try to overcome those, right? I mean, I think we all have seen where that has worked really well and we're in examples of times when it hasn't. I think in libraries, you know, we can tend to be culturally a bit hierarchical and a bit um, permission seeking, right, to do things. And one thing I, I learned from my library and from going around and talking and working with libraries is sometimes if someone heard no, like 10 years ago, they never ask again. <laughs> You know, and circumstances change, technology changes, people change, culture changes. So again, just because someone might have suggested something 10 years ago and heard no, doesn't mean that they shouldn't ask again and again and again until maybe now is the right time. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to keep challenging these assumptions that, well, we've always done it this way, so we have to keep doing it this way. Um so here's just an example from my library. We did this program called One Access. It's very common now. Libraries do it all the time where you partner with your local school system to give automatic access to all students using their student ID number. And then they get access to the public library uh, through that without having to get a whole separate card. It was a great idea. But at the time, here are all the reasons we said it couldn't be done. Oh, the school system will never agree to share their data. Our ILS doesn't work that way. Student ID numbers don't have the same number of digits as library cards. If we don't charge overdue fines, students will never return the books and parents may abuse the privilege and use the card. And then simply, we've never done something like this before. Well, needless to say, we did implement one access. We were able to overcome all of these fears and doubts. Um, and guess what? None of these were deal breakers, even though maybe in that initial conversation, we thought some of them were. So I'm sure you can think of examples of this at your library as well, where you overcame maybe doubts or fears or opposition to have a really positive outcome. So how can, you know, if you are struggling on how to overcome those kind of concerns, again, I think it, you, what you can do is always start with what is the best way to have the biggest possible impact. And that was one of the things that we discussed when we were overcoming our fears and doubts and challenges with the One Access program. So think about, okay, well, how can I have the biggest possible impact? And if that is, and if the reward is worth the effort, which I think giving students free access to libraries is a reward that's worth the effort, then we are willing to do the work to overcome those barriers. And then again, starting with that assertion that you will make this happen is going to make you feel a lot stronger and able to overcome those other challenges as they come along because they will, you know, nothing's easy. Uh, in libraries, it's not always frictionless for us behind the scenes, right? But we have to work through some of those challenges. So now I encourage you to ask yourself, does your library have a cylinder? That would be the ideal, right? Everybody who ever considers using the library or everybody in your community has a card and they use the library all the time. That would be great. Probably no library fits in that category, but that's what we're aspiring for. Is your library a funnel? So are you funneling people down and maybe you're losing a few, but most of them are getting through? Or is your uh, library more of a sieve where there's some holes and you're losing people um, along the way? So these are some things to think about as you are approaching your library um, and, your, and your customers. And so think about the fact, if you do feel like you have a sieve, you're not alone. A lot of libraries have holes in their funnel. I think most of these examples resonate with people, if not all of them, some of them. But the first step is really to find those holes. And then the next step is to start fixing them. Um, so again, to find and fix those holes, I'm taking my fixing metaphor very literally here. First, you again, wanna begin with that assertion that you will find and close the holes in your funnel because ultimately you want to get as many people as your community into your library, using your library, loving your library as possible. Then you're gonna determine where those holes are. You're gonna put the customer first. You're gonna set your imaginary customer down at the middle of the table and think about how you can fix these holes for them. 
And maybe part of doing that is asking those customers for feedback to tell you what are some of their challenges or barriers. And then tell them when you do make those changes. That's really important. It's not enough to just make the changes. You've got to tell them that you've made the changes. If you go find free, let the world know. It's a great thing. It's good news. Um, but even if you lift certain restrictions, like my computer usage example, tell people, you know, and make sure your staff all know too, because you certainly wouldn't want someone to come in and say, hey, I heard I could use the computer, even though I'm over the fine limit. And that staff member says, no, you can't. Um, so tell customers you made the change and tell them that you did it for them or that you did it because they matter or because they gave you their feedback. Um, and I've looked at a lot of library surveys. I've helped clients do surveys. I've done surveys at my own library. Customers almost always give great feedback, whether it's, hey, we need more hours on nights and weekends, or, you know, we would like to have a story time on Sunday for working parents or whatever that might be. That's good feedback. And so you not only want to act on it, but tell them that you did. Um, so here's just another quick example of a policy change, and then we'll get uh, we'll get through the rest of my slides and we can do Q&A. But this was actually an academic library, and I, full disclosure, I serve on their board, and I did some consulting for them a, a long time ago. Um, but this barrier that they identified at their academic library was that many of their students were also parents. UNC Charlotte is a huge uh, university. It's a big commuter school, as well as a lot of students living on campus, and some of those commuting students have children. And they wanted to use the library, but the idea of bringing a small child to an academic library is not always, you know, going to be viewed as, as a positive. So they created this family-friendly library room, and I got to tour it. It was so cute. Um, they had one side for the parent with computers and sharing boards, and they could even have a small meeting room if there were multiple people collaborating. And the other half was a safe area with child-sized furniture, toys, and even a little kid computer with, like, interactive learning games on it. And this room was continually booked, and they were already seeking funding to add a second one last time I checked in. Um, again, we talked about fine elimination. I haven't updated this map in a while, but this is a map that the Urban Libraries Council keeps, a fine-free library. So look at that beautiful map there. Um, email marketing and digital um, uh, e-cards have been hugely popular, as I mentioned, since the pandemic. Um, Spartanburg County Public Library was an example of a library that responded very quickly to the pandemic and began offering e-cards. Um, during that time so that people wouldn't have to physically come to the library because they couldn't because libraries were closed. So some final thoughts, as I mentioned before, you know, when I was at my library, it would often take me years to implement big changes. So change takes time. It's okay. And be patient with yourself, be patient with your colleagues, but keep the momentum going. Don't give up. If you're really passionate about fixing the holes in your funnel or addressing some of these customer barriers or challenges, you know, continue being that voice of the customer as much as you can and don't give up. And again, you can also prioritize as much as you might want to fix every single hole in your funnel. That may not be practical for you or your library. So I always say there's kind of three ways you can prioritize and you can also mix and match. You can prioritize based on the level of impact. So the things that affect the most customers, like my one access example, where we were able to reach, I think it was like 154,000 students at once. So that was a priority for us. You can also prioritize based on the level of difficulty, starting with easy fixes. So like my example with the computer usage um, being blocked due to fine limits, that was really an internal change that we had to make. I won't say it was easy, but it was easier than say one access. So it was more of a quick fix, but again, it did impact a lot of people as well. Um, but even a, a, you could even find something that's even simpler than that, you know, uh, to that would be a quick, easy fix. And then you could also um, mix and match, as I said, so mix some of these quick wins because those quick wins, those easy fixes can really bolster your organization and get people excited about making change and then tackle the heavier things. So doing a mix of that can help keep you motivated and keep you moving. Um, but just remember when in doubt, you know, put that customer at the middle of everything you do, like metaphorically speaking, um, and just make sure you're always thinking about them and their relationship with the library and how you can continue strengthening that. So there are some uh, resources I have here, and I'm sure you'll get access to these slides. This is the video I alluded to that I will show if we have time, but it's a short video 
explaining this concept. It's five minutes. So if you wanted to go to a meeting and share this concept with your library director or your branch managers, you can take this um, link. You can play them that video. It's you know free of charge. I just made it as a way to help explain this concept. Um, there's also uh, an article I wrote for the Marketing Library Services Journal on the Marketing Funnel that's also free, even if you don't have a subscription. I did a public libraries podcast a while ago um, that's available here. And then I have some more training available in my book. And here's my contact information. So we have a lot of good notifications in the chat. I'm excited to do start the Q&A. All right. Thank you, Cordelia, for uh, let's start with this question. Many of them came in uh, regarding email uh, newsletters and marketing. Mm -hmm. My library is reluctant to ask for emails to send an email newsletter. How can I collect them to build this process? And I think we touched a, a little bit on that, how they, you know, people tend to trust us, but any other thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I've personally experienced pretty much every way you can do an e-newsletter. So I started a lot in the libraries in the year 2000, you know, when we were still sending plain text emails um, uh, all the way up to nowadays when we have multiple vendors that work with just libraries doing email marketing that have these amazing, robust tools that I never could have even dreamed about, you know, when I was a little baby library marketer. Um but yeah, I think one of the biggest things you can do is integrate your email marketing with your ILS. So in a lot of cases, especially if you're using like a third party email service, like a constant contact or a MailChimp or one of those types of services, you're probably capturing emails and they're living over here in this silo. And then you have contact information in your ILS. There's a couple of challenges with that. Number one, you don't have a way to integrate that customer experience. So you don't have any way of knowing how many of your actual customers who have cards you're reaching, how many people that maybe are on your e-newsletter list who don't have a card, but you would like them to get a card. So you can't really cross pollinate. And there's also a data security issue because if you're um, maintaining contact information in two places or even having to download, upload to two different places, that can be a data uh, um, data safety issue. <laughs> Sorry, my brain just stopped working. Um, so, you know, the more you can integrate with the ILS, the better. And as I mentioned, there are some tools out there that integrate directly with your ILS through um, data sharing and, and they can do it in a way that's secure. And I've seen even one branch library systems use these services. So I know it's possible and affordable. Um, so think about that. I think that is a big one. Again, not requiring people to opt in is another one. Another low-hanging piece of fruit is that a lot of times libraries take registration for their programs in a third-party service like an online event calendar, and those emails just live there. But they, again, they don't necessarily bring them into the fold in terms of all their marketing messages. And I think as long as you're very transparent with your customers when they sign up for a card, let them know, hey, we're going to occasionally email you with information about your account and the other services available to you. When they register for a program, you can tell them that as well. And then you can pull that registration list into your larger database um, so that you're reaching more people. Great. Uh, someone asked about companies to use for email. You mentioned Mailchimp and Mailchimp and Constant Contact. Um, are there mm -hmm. are there others you would recommend? Yeah, so I try to stay platform neutral, but I have worked with some of the library industry specific companies um, that do this. So there's of course Patron Point. There is uh, Savannah from Orange Boy. There is. Um, um, innovative that does, I believe the Polaris ILS is launching uh, something called Vega Promote. And then there's also Library Aware, who I've never used or worked with, but I've heard of them. So those are kind of the four big ones that work in the library space. And generally speaking, again, I don't advocate for any one specific company, but generally speaking, if you can, it's better to use one of those companies because they know libraries, they have other library clients. So they're, you know what I mean? They just understand our industry and they can better serve us. And they understand the privacy concerns that, you know, um, and all of that. And so they can support you in that. And you can also, then you have access to a cohort of other libraries who are their clients who can guide you because they've been through it before. Constant Contact and MailChimp, great tools. I use them both. Uh, they can't do that for you, though. They can't help you with that because they're not library industry experts in the same way these other companies are. So 
um, when possible, using something like that would be, I think, better. Thank you. How much importance do you think should be given to the open rate and click rate for promotional emails? Yeah, so my goal is always that we want to be reaching as many people with our library messaging as possible. So what I like to look at is, yes, open rate and click rate are important, but I like to look at total opens and total clicks because you could send an e-blast to 20 people and 10 people open it, and that's a 50% open rate, but you've only reached 10 people. Whereas if you look at total opens, then suddenly you're incentivized to grow not only your open rate, but your total list. So then that gets you into how can I get, you know, how can I work with customers to get their contact information so I can share? How can I update my privacy policy? How can I encourage the branches to get people's email addresses when they sign up and so forth? So when I set up a data dashboard for my clients, I, I will often... Actually, I will almost always set it up with the total number of opens by month, whether you're combining multiple different emails or, or you just do one email per month, and then total clicks, because to me, that's telling you exactly how many people heard your message and acted on it. Thank you. How much time in the funnel is spent on awareness and how about the loyalty and advocacy pieces? Um, you know, I don't think we think about those at, enough in libraries. I think we think about the awareness piece a lot. Um, but the loyalty and advocacy piece, I think sometimes we're so busy just running the day-to-day -day business that we don't necessarily have time to think about it. And I do think, but I do think our library branches are a great um interaction with those loyal customers and those advocates. And so that really that person to person contact that happens at the at the desk or in the library is a really valuable um, interaction. And those staff have great ideas that can be a great source of information about your customers, their wants and needs and the barriers. But we have to be intentional about listening to them and we have to give them permission to share it because, again, we can be a little hierarchical. Some libraries, you know, people I've actually you know worked with libraries where they're like, we feel like our staff are waiting for permission. And so you've got to sometimes give the staff a formal process or permission to share what they're learning out in the branches because the staff know. I mean, just because I went out and observed the workaround and brought it back to administration was great. But those staff who've been doing Doing that work around for years probably had told their manager a hundred times, you know, this isn't a very efficient way to do this. And somebody probably said, yeah, but it's how we've already done it. And then maybe that was the end of the conversation. So encouraging those staff who, who have that frontline experience with the customer um, to speak up is really important. And they can also give you a pulse on where they think customers are in terms of loyalty and advocacy, um, as well as just encouraging, you know, customers, tell a friend, tell a family member, um, we did a campaign once just trying to, when we had launched a new online application system that was more instantaneous to just, um, we did a campaign that was tell a friend how easy it is to get a library card, forward them this email, you know? So there are things you can do to really engage your loyal customers and your advocates to help reach a broader audience. All right. We have time for one more very quickly. What are your thoughts on social media and preferred platforms? I don't know if you saw Angela Hirsch's uh, blog post a couple a week or two ago uh, where she kind of talked about how mm -hmm. it might be not the greatest for libraries in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I love Angela and what I love about her is she has like deep knowledge in these areas. So I'm not going to try to replicate what she would say, but what I would say is overall, I'm more, I would encourage you to take a step back when you're thinking about social media and think about what is it you're trying to achieve? Again, if what you're trying to achieve is to get as many people into the funnel and engage them in their journey with the library then that's how you should select what social media platforms you're on. And I would encourage you to, um, and I just talked about this actually in a webinar yesterday, I would really encourage you to think about, to look at your existing platforms, see what kinds of engagement you're getting on those platforms and really evaluate them. Is this the best place for me to be? Is this where my customers are? You know, I have a client recently who was like, well, we have this teen Instagram account and it's great, but I don't think any of the people following it are teens. In fact, they were probably other librarians from other library systems around this, their state, you know? So it's like, you want to put your effort where it's going to reach the most customers. So you could even look at the analytics 
you know, in the meta platform, which is Facebook and Instagram, you can see geographically where your followers are. And if they're all over the place, then maybe that that's not where you're reaching the most customers. So I think that's something to think about. And then I always recommend have a social media plan in place, have a policy, have guidelines, try to bring more people into social media content creation and really work on creating engagement. And when you talked about email open and click rates, the other thing I encourage my clients to track is social media engagement, not number of followers, but actual engagement. How many people are clicking, liking, commenting? Because again, those are the people who are your loyal uh, followers and they're more likely to help you reach a broader audience that way. So um, so I can't tell you what platforms you should use because it's going to vary from library to library and audience to audience, but I can tell you to look at the data that you have and see what's currently working and build on that. And if there are some things that aren't working, like that teen Instagram example, maybe you can go ahead and phase that out. Exactly. Thank you so much, uh, Cordelia, for mm -hmm. your information and your resources. And of course, um, yes, the resources will be shared on our website uh, post-conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, our closing session is coming up at 2.30, and we have uh, David Lankis who will be giving that. So um, that will be the, the end of our conference uh, when that is finished. So hope to see many of you at that. If not, uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day and so on. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it, and I hope everyone got a lot out of it. Thank you.